welcome you here today if you're here for the first time definitely welcome everybody who's joining us through the social web and our web page our website as we come this morning um, to consider a portion of scripture open up your Bibles in the chap in the book of John chapter 3 As always, as I would, I want to believe as every preacher of the gospel, we're honored, but at the same time humbled to be able to be, to speak God's word to God's people. And we pray that this morning is no different. And as we consider this a portion of scripture this morning, John 3, uh, John 3, chapter uh John chapter 3, verse 1 through 15. The topic for the morning is regeneration and not religion. This, this morning, we find ourselves in a very important passage in all of Scripture. Considering the nature of the subject, regeneration, many would say that this is one of the most important portions of Scripture. The theme, regeneration, or being born again, which is the second work of God in salvation, the first being election, we have been chosen before the foundation of the world, predestined to be saved. So regeneration takes place when, when at a moment's time the spiritually dead sinner is awakened into spiritual life by the hearing of the word, the word of truth. So God in a sovereign way, sovereignly imparts life upon him. So let's go to the scripture. Let's go to the passage. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone. Everyone who was born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you not the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you. This is the third time in these first 15 verses where Jesus says, truly, truly. He's going to make a point. Everything you've known, everything you've all you've learned, I'm going to tell you something new. There's something new. The truth of life is telling you something new, so get ready for it. We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Important scripture. One of the most important scripture in a uh, portion of scripture in all the Bible. And the Bible has plenty of important topics. But this particular topic being brought here, Jesus is, is, 
in this scene with a Pharisee coming up to him. Much has been said and written by many on the how-tos of being born again. Evangelists have preached many a times concerning being born again, and some have even given instructions on what the sinner can do to be a born-again person. We've been there. We've heard it. We've seen it. And in many places, it, it still goes on. The truth is that what many folks are failing to see or realize is that there is no manual or set of instructions that can grant us that salvation, that salvation which can only come solely from God. Jesus, the apostles, John the Baptist, evangelists, or any other of the New Testament writers did not leave any written instructions or steps on how or what to do to be born again. As we consider the scripture that we just read, Jesus is laying it out for Nicodemus. In this passage that we're looking at this morning, we have Jesus. This is the background. We have Jesus at his first Passover doing all kinds of miracles. That's a highlight for many folks. In the midst of that background, we have Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a man who, like many religious unbelievers, is intrigued by Jesus. And at some point in our lives, as unbelievers, as sinners, Jesus does have intrigue. Because the, the words that Jesus speaks have power, have authority. So there is intrigue. A Pharisee, a man who, like many religious unbelievers, key word here, a man who, like many religious unbelievers, is intrigued by Jesus. He is, as many folks are, full of accomplishments, of renowned status, certain that he has and they ha or they have done everything to merit or obtain heaven, but no true assurance of salvation. And that is the reality that hits him in this passage and hits many when they hear the words of Jesus. Apologize for that, but when you're up here, there's something about the human body. I don't know about the rest of the, the bastard, but uh, even my lips dry out. So, plus I get passionate when I speak, so I try not to be too loud up here. They are fearful inside. Here we have Nicodemus. His, na his Greek name, his name is, uh, you know, it's a Greek name. Nick, or Nike, which means victor over the people. He's a Pharisee in Israel. Pharisee means the separated ones. That's important to know in this passage. Pharisees means the separated one. Nicodemus is one of those. He's a separated one. He was an important man in the Israel by virtue of his stature amongst the people. Now, Pharisees, according to, jo to Josephus, there were around 6,000 of these men during the time of Jesus. The separated ones, the wealthy ones, the educated ones, the rich ones. Here's an important detail. They knew the Old Testament law and kept them. You, for you to be a Pharisee, you were just not a regular Joe Schmo. Come, uh, you were an, a well-dotted, instructed individual. You were separated for God. Pay attention to this scene here. We have Nicodemus, a Pharisee, who through all, all the scripture are the enemies of Christ. He's coming to Christ. He's coming to Jesus. They knew the Old Testament law and kept them. From, from, the, from what I studied on Nicodemus, he was one of the top three men in his post as a Pharisee. 
So they knew the Old Testament law. They kept them, at least superficially. They were the enemies of Jesus. This setting is so rare since it is the only mention of a Pharisee coming to Jesus in all four Gospels. How rare is this scene here? It's so rare that you don't find another one in all the Gospels. People that know God, people that knew the Scripture, people that are supposed to be living by the law, expecting the Messiah, expecting the, the Son that God would send to redeem Israel, the Savior. They know this because they know the Scriptures. That was, that's what their role was. Only one in all the Gospels, only one Pharisee you see coming to Christ, coming to Jesus and being saved. There was only another second Pharisee, and that one, Jesus went after him on the road to Damascus. That was Paul. A man who was educated, intellectually prepared, dotted in everything that had to do with the Old Testament law. Yet he says that when he saw, he saw Christ in that vision, he took everything he knew and considered it dung. Rubbish. Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. Wealthy, educated, perhaps their most highly respected scholar. Member of the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin, which was the Supreme Court in Israel. This was a post for retired high priest. He was one of them. He was an elite by virtue of his rank and status and was viewed as such by the nation of Israel. Again, Jesus is, Jesus here in, is in his first year of his ministry and at his first Passover, as we see noted in John chapter 2. This story, this, this scene really begins in chapter 2, verse 23. It says, many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles, which he did, many believed in his name, in Jesus' name, when they saw the miracles, which he did. Verse 24, but Jesus did not commit. In other words, Jesus did not believe. It's the same word as in verse 23. He did not believe himself unto them because he knew all men. So John is, is, is pointing out, you know, he's pointing out Jesus is God. He's omniscient. Why? He can read what's inside of man. So pay attention to that detail because this is where Nicodemus is going to show up. And needed not anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. You know, that's, that's the starting point. When we come to Christ, we need to be in a, in a position where we understand that doesn't matter what we do or what we say or how we go about things, Jesus knows everything about us. I mean... You can only get so far by abstaining away from folks. At the end of the day, Jesus knows everything about you and me. Nicodemus knows something. So let's go to the topic here. Let's go to the text. Now there was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So pay attention. This is a Pharisee who's an enemy of, of Jesus, who's a scholar on Old Testament scripture. He, he, he does the initial recognition. He calls him teacher. He says, he doesn't even call him by name. He calls him rabbi. Hey, hey, hey we're, we're on equal terms here. You're a teacher. I'm a teacher. 
But there's something different about Jesus. And Nicodemus is one of the ones in chapter 2 that is witnessing what's taking place. John doesn't write what miracles they were. But yet they were impacted. They were impactful because Nicodemus is paying attention. And so were many of them. Because he says here in verse 2, Rabbi, we, he's implying not just himself, but there some other folks, perhaps Pharisees themselves, we know that you are a teacher from God. He recognizes that much. He, that Jesus is a teacher and not just a teacher, a teacher from God. He is flattering Jesus by addressing him as rabbi. At least you think he is. Jesus answers a question that Nicodemus doesn't even ask. He's just like, hey, Rabbi, we know you're from God. Here's what, it's not even a, a response, but Jesus responds. Jesus answered, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or from above, the term born again it is synonym with from above. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus does not ask a question, but Jesus tells him something that shakes his, shakes his boots. And he's understanding. He's understanding what Jesus is telling him. Because Jesus is giving them an illustration, and Pharisees were the masters of, of these illustrations. They would give earthly illustrations to make a point, to make a spiritual point. Nicodemus is the top scholar in Israel as a Pharisee. So he's asking, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? There's a couple of things here. Jesus completely bypasses Nicodemus' approach towards him. He replies, truly, truly. Listen, listen to what I got to say. Truly, truly, there's something new. Something different than what you've expected. Something different than what you've been taught. Something different than what you've learned or you've practiced all of your life. Truly, truly. He was about to say something to him that was totally new to him. It, was also meant, it, it also meant that he, he is correcting a falsehood. Something that was going to be, something that was going to be removed. The ground from under Nicodemus' feet. Jesus answered the real question Nicodemus had in his heart. Jesus read his heart because he is God. So Nicodemus comes, Rabbi, you must be a teacher from God. <laughs> the things you're doing, miracles hadn't happened in Israel for over 400 years. All of a sudden, something, there's something brewing in town. What is this? Who is this? It's Jesus Christ. What is he doing? He's doing, he's doing mighty things, things that only a man who is being driven by God can do. Nicodemus recognizes that when he... Tries to introduce himself on verse 1, verse 2. So he doesn't ask a question, but you know what's happening here? From what John said in chapter 2, Jesus read the question that was in Nicodemus' heart. In all honesty, what Nicodemus wanted to know is about the kingdom. He has all the knowledge. He has all the history. He studied all the scripture. He knows it from back to front. He's a scholar of the word, of the scriptures. He's a religious leader. Religious, key word, religious leader. Yet he finds himself, like many people find themselves, living a life of religiosity all their lives, yet they are missing salvation.
Jesus answered the real question Nicodemus has in his heart. So the question is in his heart. Jesus, he, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. Oh, if there was some of the Pharisees long for was to see the kingdom, see heaven, just like all believers do. Jesus read his heart because he is God. He knew what was in man. He knew what was in his heart. Nicodemus wanted to see the kingdom of God. The analogy Jesus is making in this passage makes it clear that what happens in the process of regeneration or new birth is something that happens to you. There's nothing that you can do on your behalf. Something that you make no contribution to. You have to be born again. So the analogy is an earthly analogy. Is the analogy of birth. Nicodemus is understanding this. Can a man being old go back to his mother's womb? Nicodemus is understanding that what Jesus is saying is humanly impossible. In other words, I'm a scholar. I've given all of my life for this, for God's word, to defend the scriptures, to protect it, to lead people, to be a leader amongst a nation. Who has received the law of God. But deep down inside him. He, he knows. He knows he's not saved. He knows that all of that stuff. Hasn't equated to him. Equated him nothing. And to think that many people read this. And I don't know how they get a different message. This is the primary message of regeneration. In other words, uh, it's the second work of God in salvation. And we can't do anything about it. It's from God. Nicodemus, being the scholar that he is, understand what Jesus is saying to him regarding seeing or getting into the, the kingdom is virtually impossible. Jesus answered in verse in 3.5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, or born from above. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Oh, that, that word, everyone? Listen, Nicodemus is putting it all together. Wait a minute. You're telling me that what I need to do to see the kingdom, to enter into the kingdom, is something that I cannot humanly possibly do. Regeneration is something that takes place. It's the work of God that takes place by God unto you and I. We have no salvation unless God regenerates us into salvation. Nicodemus in verse 9 says, how can these things be? He's not asking. He's not asking as he doesn't know. He's saying, how is this possible? Everyone? How is this possible? There's nothing I can do. To be saved? How is that possible? I got the same way you and I had no control in the, the day we were born. We had nothing to do with it. You and I had nothing to do with it. That's how being born from above is. It's a sovereign act of God. How can these things be? Jesus answered, Are you the teacher of Israel and yet do not understand these things? Born of water and the Spirit, you are the highest rabbinic scholar in Israel. Are you not? Nicodemus, Nicodemus knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand. Without a doubt, he had memorized many, if not most, of the ancient writings. Jesus is telling him, listen, 
Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. A few things to look at here. Born of the Spirit and water and Spirit. Go to Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 through 27. Notice the I wills in this passage. Because, like we said from the beginning, this is a work of God. Ezekiel 36 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your unclean uncleanness, and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. I, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Nicodemus knows this. When Jesus is telling him, listen, we have to be born from the water and the spirit. He, has, he, he, he can go back to Ezekiel and, and understand this. This is his job, this is what he knows. This is what he speaks. These, indivi these, indi these individuals were separated from everything else. All they did was be a, a religious leader and knowing the scriptures. He knows this. Here's what God thinks of the flesh. For those of us who think otherwise. Here's what God thinks of the flesh. That which, is, that which is of the flesh is flesh. Genesis 6, 5 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In other words, it didn't stop. It doesn't stop. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. The second analogy, earthly analogy he gives us is that the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it's coming from or where it goes. So it is with everyone. And that's when one of the reasons he's being, you know, shaken is everyone. What do you mean everyone? For the Pharisees, they believe that only them and, and the nation of Israel and nobody else is going to be saved. There was no way into heaven or kingdom. Everybody else was going to hell according to them, according to what they believed. So when Jesus is telling them everyone, he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. After everything we've done, after everything I've been doing, after uh, my life being separated and preserving, has nothing to do with you. It all has to do with God. Salvation is a free gift of God. He chose us from the, before the foundation of the world. And then the, second, the first miracle for man is regeneration. Our only, our only responsibility is responding to the call. When we hear it, we respond. Without being regenerated, we can't repent. Without being regenerated, we can't obey God's word. We could read the word. A lot of people read the word. And their lives are still the same. In shambles. Because you know why? Regeneration needs to take place in man in order to be able to follow and obey God's words. Without regeneration, we are blind. Nicodemus knows what Jesus is telling him here is humanly impossible to accomplish. Listen to this. The Pharisees believed in heaven. They believed in hell, judgment, divine sovereignty, human responsibility, angels, resurrection. He knows what Jesus is telling them. He just thought it was for them and the and the Jews. If 
he is genuinely concerned as most unsaved individuals generally are as well. Here, look at verse 11. Truly, truly, I say to you, the third time in, the, in these passages that Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. He changes the pronoun from their personal conversation they're having into a plural one. We speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. So Jesus has already read his heart because Nicodemus is, he's interested in the kingdom. How am I going to, how do I get assurance that I'm going to see the kingdom, that I'm going to enter into the kingdom? Here in verse 11, Jesus is telling them, you don't believe. He's not a believer. You, and he's, and the you here is not you, him. You, you all don't believe. You've seen the miracles and believe all of that. But when you hear the word, it wasn't for you. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will, I, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. The son of man. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again or born from above. He is letting him know that it is only through a sovereign act of God that he can be regenerated into the life that will lead him into the kingdom. Regeneration is a holy, sovereign work of God. Paul writes in Titus 3.5, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Paul also writes in 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How? How, how? how does this happen? Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 1. And you, you and me, and you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Listen, without being regenerated by God through his spirit, we are dead in our sins and trespasses. You can't respond to, you can't respond to, to God. You can't. You can't obey God. The free will. Well, wait, wait a minute. Well, I got a free will. Pastor touched this last week or a week, two weeks ago. Yeah, you got a free will. When you're an unregenerated individual, you have a free will. You have a free will to choose how you're going to sin. Because you don't have a will to obey and honor God without being saved by God. We do have will. And even that is, is, rest, is restrained to some extent. Because if God doesn't put a leash on, on many of us, What's inside of us, in our flesh, would really manifest itself. We do have free will. But without God, the only will you have is, how do I sin? What type of sin? Big sin, little sin. That's, that's the only free will you have. You can only respond to God when God calls upon you and his spirit revives in you through the act of regeneration. Puts a new heart in you. Paul writes, and he, and you, he made alive. In other words, you were dead spiritually in trespasses and sins. James says in James 1.18, says, of his own will. Are you saved because you chose? Are we saved because we choose? <laughs> yes, somebody made a calling. There's a calling. There's a lot of callings. You go to an evangelist, uh, you go to... 
uh, you know, st uh, stadiums, and there's calling. But that's a verbal calling from a preacher, a minister. But there's one calling that has to come from God in order for you to be genuinely saved. These people responded, wow, they believe. The scriptures, they believe. They saw what Jesus was doing. They believed. But they didn't believe into saving faith. Nicodemus believed too, but now he's like, oh, he's coming at night. I heard, what does that mean? Why he come at night? R.C. Sproul said, that's because he didn't come at daytime. <laughs> that's true. He, uh, he says that a lot of people have written a lot of books on why he came at night. He only came at night because he just didn't show up at daytime. James says, of his own will, who? God's. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. This is an Old Testament passage referring to those who were bitten by the poisonous snakes. If they were to look up at the gold serpent on the pole, they would be physically saved. It was just an act of faith. They just had to look. And they would be saved. They would be healed. Not saved. They would be physically healed. Interesting that this, the analogy is here. As, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. If they were to look up at the golden serpent, they would be physically healed. Jesus, in the same manner, is letting them know that those who would look up to the Son of Man, lifted up on that cross... They too would be saved as well, spiritually saved. That whoever, verse 15, believes in him may have eternal life. That's another thing that, that shook Nicodemus's boots. What do you mean, whoever? Anybody who believes? Wait a minute, how about everything we've done? All the preaching, all the teaching, all the vigils. All the programs, all the conferences. This is why his question is, how can these things be? At this point, Nicodemus is stunned. He came to know more about Jesus and ended up learning more about himself. He leaves as an unbeliever. No doubt the words that Jesus laid on him began to brew the interior man in Nicodemus. He leaves, he leaves disappointed like the rich young man. They left disappointed. Kind of like what you're saying, but I kind of not like it. I mean, all this success, I have all this money. All this knowledge, all this separation. They were so separate that if in a Sabbath, if they had a sore throat, Usually what they took for that was with vinegar. During the rest of the week, you would gargle the vinegar and spit it out. But if you had a sore throat on Saturday and you had to preach, you couldn't spit it out because it was considered work. You had to swallow it. That's how devoted they were to their position, to their role. No doubt the words that Jesus laid on him began to brew in the interior man in Nicodemus. We see him taking a position for the sake of Christ in John chapter 7, verse 45. When the Pharisees had sent out the guard to arrest Jesus. The pastor touched this scripture too. They sent them. Uh, uh, listen, we want to, he, he's speaking over there. We want you to go get him. Bring him to us. Arrest him. And they come back. Well, where is he? <laughs> we couldn't arrest that guy. Mind you, Jesus never had any weapons. He, he, didn't, he wasn't a karate guy. Jesus was just a carpenter. Yet the guards go with their armory to arrest him. Hey, you need to bring that guy here. So they see the guards coming. Where is he? We weren't going to arrest that guy. 
the way he spoke, he spoke with authority. There is no way. Listen, there was something divine that they could not go to what they went in there to do, to arrest him. That's in chapter 7, verse 45. But then later, a little, la little later on in the same chapter, cha verse 50 and 52, when the Pharisees, so when the, when the guards come back, they could arrest them. Nicodemus chimes in. Does our law judge a man before it hears him and know what he's doing? You know, uh, I'm sure he's he's maybe you know oh sorry I'm sure he's he's watching himself before he's saying what he's saying he's the top scholar in Israel he's a top Pharisee does our law judge a man before it hears him and know what he is doing this is two years later the word that Jesus laid upon him are brewing in his heart He's still a Pharisee. He's afraid of what he has to do or what he's going to do. They looked at him and sarcastically asked, Huh? Are you from Galilee as well? Are you from Galilee also? They mocked him. They mocked him. Nicodemus, you know, yeah, he's had two years to, to, I don't know how many sleepless nights he's had. I'm sure after he departed from his encounter with Jesus, he went back to the scriptures. He went back to Ezekiel and looked at it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all there, yeah, it's all there. Are you from Galilee also, Nicodemus? At the end of cha John chapter 19, the pastor preached this last week. We see a born from above man, regenerated by God, transformed by the words of his Savior, bringing 100, over 100 pounds of spices to put on the body of Jesus. An old man. We see an old man, Nicodemus, an old man, a regenerated man. He joined Joseph of Arimathea in bringing the body down of Jesus. A hundred pounds. You know what? He's my savior. What he said to me is true. I can't get around that. What I, everything I've known, you know, we're nowhere. And even though Jesus was dead when he went to with this, he believed, they believe in resurrection. No doubt Nicodemus doing his homework and understanding what Christ was preaching, what Jesus was preaching. Many believe in Jesus as those did back in chapter 2. Impressed by the miracles. But then his words began to penetrate hearts with, con with conviction following. And conviction leads either to conversion or opposition. It is impossible to stay neutral. Many folks believed in Jesus, but many of them decided not to follow. How do you believe, Pastor? You believe by hearing. Hearing the word of God. Paul says in Romans 10, 17, So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The proper rendering to that is the words of Christ, which means the message about Christ, the gospel. Regeneration is something that happens to you. If you're here this morning, if you've been in church all your life, there's nothing that you can do to earn. It's not about good deeds. We, you know, the believer works good deeds because you were saved before the foundation of time, 
And those good deeds are already ordained for you to do. Paul would say. We were called for that. I don't know where you find yourself this morning. A highly prepared individual who knew the old, the ancient scriptures was seeking Christ for salvation because he understood that none of that other stuff, you know, from, from the way Jesus laid it out to him, really there's nothing humanly you can do. The analogy is crystal clear. There were earthly analogies of things that are true and we're just, we just accept it. It's true. How do we believe? We believe by hearing the word of God. We believe by hearing the word of God. John, in John 6, 37, to close. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. We have to believe. We have to believe. If you're a believer, you believe. But you believe because God worked upon you. His grace in a sovereign manner, he regenerated you from your dead state into a new cre creation, as Paul would say in Corinthians. Now you're a new person. You're a new individual. Now you have the Spirit of God in you to be able to follow him, obey him, live for him, be separated unto him. I don't know where you find yourself at. But I'm sure Nicodemus isn't the only one who's always thought that I've kept the religion. I don't harm anybody. I don't steal the neighbor's chicken. And then unfortunately, just like many of these folks, many will continue to look the other way. They will. John says, Jesus says in John's, the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Let's stand. Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for your word. Lord, and this was only, you know, this topic we can preach for months, Lord. Topic of regeneration, of salvation, Lord. We just went through some things, Lord, just to put in our hearts. Make us ponder, Lord. Lord, we pray that your word does what it's intended to do, Father. You said your word never comes back void. Lord, I pray for everyone here this morning, Lord, Lord who, who, who need a genuine encounter with you, Lord. Oh, Lord, may your word awaken them, revive them, Lord, into living hope. Lord, may your word be on us, Father. May we long your word. May we de desire your word. Lord, may we come to you. Lord, and if we're stuck somewhere, Father, in unbelief, Lord, may we do a prayer. Lord, help my unbelief. Oh, Lord, if it is in your sovereign grace for me to be saved, Lord, awaken in me. Regenerate in me that spirit to be able to walk, to serve you, to live for you, to honor you. Lord, that my days, my remaining days on this earth, Father, may I live them, Lord, to honor the one who died for me and who's sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. Lord, I trust your word has done its purpose this morning. We trust these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.